Amen. You may be seated. I, uh, for those of you who were here last week and you were part of the, the big vote for Cameron Gibbs to come as our worshiping youth pastor, thank you for being a part of that. We're really excited about him. I've been texting him all week, trying to get furniture lined up and stuff, and uh, he sent me a meme yesterday off of Pinterest. It was a picture of a man underwater with two thumbs held up above the water like this. And, you know, he's in Georgia, northern Georgia, and he said, in case you're wondering, we're still here. They've had four straight days of deluge. I said, well, what's the deal, brother? Can't you pray that this way? I mean, you're the holy man. Pray it this way, you know? So we're working on it. I said, instead of driving out with your dad, um, you're going to take a big fishing boat and put the car on it, right? He said, laugh out loud, you know? So be in prayer for him. Um, This time we're going to go ahead and release the children. If we need to release any of those for children's church or preschool. Also want to put before you, we have Promotion Sunday, which is coming up in two Sundays. If you don't know what that is, that means if you have children or grandchildren in Sunday school, we promote them. As they go up from second grade to third grade, we do the same thing with the school district. So August 19th, we have Promotion Sunday. And you know, God is always looking for those whose hearts are available to bless his people. And it's such a big part of his program to pass down the faith for his children. So I'm going to ask you if you would consider if God is asking you to be part of teaching them. You notice I didn't say workers. I didn't say helpers. I said teaching them because anybody can teach the word of God. And what I love to hear is a few people that have told me recently. I I asked one particular woman, I said, "Why, why is it every year you're asking me like six months in advance about vacation Bible school? What is so big about that for you? And she said, you know what, Greg? I learn more from teaching the kids about the Bible than I do any other time. When I'm teaching them, I'm learning my Bible, all these things that I don't know. And so I want to ask you to consider if you want to be a teacher, someone that can love and build into the next generation of God's people. And if you do, talk to Ms. Coleman, please. Just talk to Chip, please, okay? They'd be happy to help you with that, the Christian education team, all right? Also, one other thing, Randy and Sean. Randy, do you mind putting your hand up? If you remember this good-looking devil right here, he was baptized last week in obedience to God. Isn't that awesome? I love that. Isn't that awesome? And uh, I told you at that time that they were passing through. Unfortunately, things uh, haven't worked out the way they thought on an earthly realm, but in God's big plan they have. So they're moving back to Iowa. So tomorrow is their moving day, right? This is how you always find out if people really love you. If anybody shows up to help you move. So at 3 p.m. tomorrow, they're loading, and they could use a little help. And so you can see him, or here, here's a number you can write down, uh, 641-691-4241. 641-691-4241, and you can help she, Randy and Sean to maybe get some of those things. You, you don't have a piano, do you, man? No. Okay, then I, I'm good. Luke and I might make it if you don't have a piano, okay? He could probably load it on his own, but... Anyhow, we're in Exodus chapter 20. If you're new to Calvary, we love to preach through the Bible because I don't have anything great to give you, but Jesus has a lot to give you, okay? And so we're going to be in Exodus chapter 20 as we've been working our way through the book of Exodus where God reveals himself as a central theme, who he is. He's revealing to the world, whether it's the Egyptians or whether it's the Israelites or other surrounding groups, the Hittites, the Amorites, who he is as the one and only God. And we kind of come to this apex of the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. And this is what it says, verse 1, And God spoke all these words. Now, that's very important. That's the most important part of this. God spoke these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt and out of the land of slavery. That's the rationale for what he's going to do. You shall have, commandment number one, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. Verse 5, you shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation, and to those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Verse 8, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, 
nor your male or female servants, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God has given you. Verse 13, you shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, nor covet your neighbor's wife, or his male or female servant, or his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. And when the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. An appropriate response, right? They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself that we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will surely die. Verse 20, Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. And the people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. As we look at the Ten Commandments, I want you to think about the code that we are to live by, which is the Ten Commandments. And we have codes all around our life, don't we? Recently, because of multiple injuries and surgeries to my children, um, I've been traveling a lot to Carl Springs to do a lot of surgeon's appointments, okay? So I've seen Dr. Mitchell and Dr. Shaw and P.A. Trish and P.A. Brian and all these, all these different people. I'm getting lost in all the doctors. But what I appreciate about doctors is the fact that they hold to an oath, right? Their code, the Hippocratic Oath. First, do what? No harm. Praise God. Don't cut on me if I'm going to make it. Don't cut on me, right? If I get hurt in a car accident, you roll me into an ER. Don't start cutting on a good body. Don't mess it up, okay? I mean, it's in good shape. Don't mess it up. Just kidding. First, do no harm. And then theirs is a noble and compassionate profession, right? Don't you want your doctor to be noble in dealing with you and compassionate in his bedside manner or hers? Isn't that what you want? I do, right? What about other professions? I was thinking through this a little bit. In my own profession, my background before, counsel, you know, in counseling and psychology before I was a preacher, and we have these ethical principles, beneficence, which is to do good, non-malfeasance, which is what the doctor has, do not do any harm, Preserve the autonomy of the individual, right? If I was in an Asian Pacific culture, it'd be about the collective. But in our culture, we preserve the autonomy of the individual. These are all ethical principles, codes that we're supposed to live by. Confidentiality, right? What is said in the sanctity of the counseling relationship, you do not share with other people. Confidentiality, those kinds of things. Lawyers are really good about this. Confidentiality. Any great lawyer I've ever known, they don't break confidentiality for nothing, right? I mean, you can get disbarred for that. Is that not true? So, I mean, lawyers are like the best at confidentiality. What about the military, right? You guys know I came from Carl Springs, huge, four huge bases there, uh, special forces, you know, armored cab, all the stuff. And, and you have all these different codes, right? You have all these different codes. Like one of them is you leave no man behind. Men go down, right? As a Marine, did you want to be left behind? No, you want your brothers to pull you out of the muck, right, and not leave you to get decimated. We don't leave a man behind. Or, as the SEALs say, there's no easy day. Every day is a hard day as a SEAL, right? They have all these different little codes that they have. We live by these codes. We, we process our lives by these codes, and the Ten Commandments are no different than that except for that they're greater than all those codes. They're greater than the oath that we take to defend the Constitution and all enemies, foreign and domestic, in the military. They're greater than the oath that we take as a vow to our spouse to be married to them and be faithful to them. One of the Ten Commandments, till death do us part. The Ten Commandments are greater than all those things. And it's interesting, as I was looking through the history of the Ten Commandments in the United States, it's not a political statement, don't need anything about that, but just in the history of the United States, how they were, they were kind of big with the founders, the founding fathers. And then they, they kind of weren't that big in the 1800s. And then they came back into prominence. And they were in our schools and in our courthouses, right? You can look at pictures of courthouses in New York City. 
It's funny to think about this. And above the judge's head, it says, in God we trust. In our money, we say the same thing. In God we trust. And and we we put the Ten Commandments, even in my mother-in-law's house, in her bedroom, my in-laws, they have the Ten Commandments next to their bed. Very prominent in our cultures. But over time, those things have been slowly eroded and removed, have they not? Is that just not a simple reality? If you go to the local high school today, do you see the Ten Commandments? Do you? Do you see them? No, but my mother did when she was in school in Tennessee as a young girl in the 40s. She saw the Ten Commandments. But my children don't now. When my son goes to see you, he doesn't see the Ten Commandments. I bet he can't find a copy that's not in a ministry or in a Bible on campus at CU, right? I mean, it's just the nature of it. But guess what? Even though we forget, God doesn't forget. And what I want you to think about a little bit about this is this. We need the Ten Commandments as healthy fences, as healthy boundaries to our life. The great politician Ronald Reagan said, good fences make good neighbors. Remember that back in the 80s? Good fences make good neighbors about us and the Russians. Boundaries have a way of making us better people, right? Because there's a fence between me and my neighbor, I know that's his land and I can't just do whatever I want to on it. And that's his house and I can't do whatever I want to on it. And the the Ten Commandments are about this healthy boundary. So I want you to be thinking a little bit about that, that God doesn't forget the word that he gave us. He made us, he designed us, and he knows our tendency within to do what's wrong, to have a bent to do what's bad, to look after ourselves first and not after our neighbor. And so he's given us this code, this code to live by that helps us be checked to mitigate our wrongful behavior and to give us healthy boundaries, right? I was thinking about this. My dog is fenced into my backyard. I've talked about Zeke, the Australian cattle dog. And I was coming to the men's prayer breakfast yesterday and as I was coming to Men's Prayer Breakfast in the dark, because we had to cook. Thanks a lot, Steve. Thanks a lot, man. We had to cook. He's making breakfast burritos. Coming in the dark, I was coming down 5th Street, and I almost ran over a little bitty black, black Labrador puppy like this. He was out in the street. I didn't see him in the dark. So I was almost upon him. I swerved. He had a collar and a tag. I tried to stop and get him. He took off. Smart guy bad man, run away from the bad man, right? But I worried about that dog all day that he may not have made it through the day. And I thought about how when Zeke's fenced in in my backyard, his natural proclivity to chase cars is in check. And so he's a nice ripe old age of 10 now for a dog. If we would not have fenced him in wherever we lived, he would have been gone because he loves to chase cars, right? I want you to think about that as you. We have a tendency to chase idols in our life, okay? So as we go through the Ten Commandments, I want you to think about them as these healthy boundaries for you. So first of all, consider their origin and their author, right? Chapter 20, verse 1, it says, the God spoke all these words. This is the most important part of the Ten Commandments. It's not the individual ones, but that who they come from. God spoke them. They are words from God straight from the Almighty. So we probably ought to pay attention. Why should we pay attention? Because he's the creator of the universe. We know that he created everything out of nothing. And he created us in his image, both men and women created in his image. Amen? And when he created us in his image, he designed us a certain way. And he put us in charge of all things in his creation except for him. We were just lower than him, according to Psalms 8. A little lower than the angels in him. And he put us in charge of all these things. But he knows the fallen nature that we have. And so he speaks words of life into our lives, okay? Think of the Ten Commandments as ten words of life. Remember Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it how? To the full or abundantly. Jesus is not a cosmic killjoy. He's speaking truth into our lives and they're words from the Almighty to bless us and to care for us, okay? That's what I want us to begin with. Ultimately, if we trust our God, we will trust what he asks us to do, that it's what's best for us, right? He's the author and the originator of the Ten Commandments. This is what Al Mohler, 
president of Southern Baptist Seminary says, to fail to trust these words is to fail to trust in God himself who gave us these truthful words. If we fail to trust in God, then we're going to fail to trust in his words. If we fail to trust in his words, we fail to trust in him. They're axiomatic. So the first thing I want you to consider is their source, their origin, their author. They're from God. They're not made by men. So they must have an importance. Second of all, I want you to think a little bit about their arrangement and their function, right? Just think about the first four. I am the Lord your God. Have no other gods before me. Make no graven image. Do not misuse my name. Keep the Sabbath holy. The first four are vertical in nature. They have to do with our relationship with God. So we probably ought to take those pretty seriously. They're vertical in nature. They have to do with our relationship with God. What about the following six? Starting with honor your father and mother and do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not covet, all those things. What about those? They're more horizontal in nature, right? They have to do with our relationships with each other. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I'd like it if you don't lie to me. I think that's a good thing for us to have honesty in our relationship. That's a good thing. And so I want you to think about their pattern in their relationship. God's very intentional. Which ones does he put first? The commandments for who? Our relationship with him, right? Because if we're in right relationship with him vertically, then we're a lot better off to be in right relationship with each other horizontally. Does that make sense to you? So the first four of the foundation, the final six vertically, I mean off of the vertical, the horizontal are, are more about us. Now, now the other thing I want you to think about this is they have to be in harmony, right? We have to see God and him rightly and react to him appropriately for us to see each other rightly and to react to each other appropriately, right? If I don't believe what God says that you're made in his image, whether you're a man or a woman, and that you have great value as the highest of his creation, then it's going to be easy to kill you. It is. If you're just protoplasm, this stuff that just comes out of the soup, that's easy to kill. I don't have any problems with that. That's easier than killing a deer out here, right? So how we see God and what he says has to do with how we see each other. They have to be in harmony with each other. So as we look at the arrangement and the function, vertical the first four, six horizontal to each other, and they have to live in harmony, right? Now, I run into a couple of objections at this point when I was talking about this to a couple of people this week. The first objection is, well, Greg, you know, the Ten Commandments are cool and all, but I don't really need this list of rules of do nots from this authoritarian God. That's what one guy said to me. I don't need this list of do nots from this authoritarian God. Is that what the Ten Commandments are? Is that really what they're about? That was his complaint. My response was this. Negative commands are superior to positive commands, to which he looked at me like this. What? Negative commands, do not do something, are superior to positive commands, and this is why. If I tell you, you can eat peanut butter, that tells you what to do, right? What can you eat? What can you not eat? Everything else. Now, if I say, do not eat the peanut butter, what can you not eat? What can you eat? Everything else. That works a lot better, right? The negative command tells you one thing you cannot do specifically and tells you all the other things you can do. Negative commands are specific, and they are more broad and give you more freedom and more liberty under God to how to live. Now, when I introduced this to this man, he had to think about this for a little while. He wasn't used to thinking about this. He used to negative being bad, positive being good. No? Like electricity, you need both, right? And so the negative commands are okay. The, the second thing I ran into was this, this idea that, that if God's telling us not to do something, maybe he's just keeping us from the good. Maybe he's just keeping us from the good stuff. To which I replied, is that how the loved ones in your life treat you? What do you mean? Did your mother and father hurt you and keep you from the good stuff? Was that their primary thing? Well, no. Did your wife keep you from the good stuff, away from all the nice things? Well, no, of course not. She does these things. 
What about your children or your job? Well, he did have to say his boss was kind of like that, but everybody else treated him pretty good, right? I said, people who love you don't keep you from the good stuff. They keep you from what? The bad stuff. I don't want my little three-year-old running out in the street and getting killed. So I tell her, do not leave the yard because I'm trying to preserve her life. I love my dog, so I fence him in. He's instinctual. He chases cars. God loves us, so he gives us these boundaries that are helpful to us, okay? So let's go ahead and look at those a little bit. And I want you to think about them as you go through the 10 this way. What attribute of God is displayed in those, okay? What attributes of God is displayed in that? First of all, verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. Straight sentence, right? Well, you shall have no other gods before you. This boundary does away with atheism, a belief in no God, because God says what? You shall have no other gods before me, therefore there must be a God. He's telling you that, right? He's speaking. It does away with polytheism or multiple gods, because how many gods does God want you to worship according to this? One. So you can't have multiple gods, so Hinduism, those kinds of things are out. It does away with pantheism, which is God is everywhere. The divine is in all things. You shall have no other gods before me means that there's different false gods and that there's one true God. There's an exclusivity to it. So pantheism is out. The things like the force that you see in Star Wars or or Buddhism or Shintoism, those, those things are out. Pantheism is out, right? It also hammers home the priority that we give to another it or person, right? You can't put an it or a person above God. He's the eternal living, life-giving spirit, and so we own our homage to him. He says it right here, you shall have no other gods before me. I must be in first place, right? God desires to love us, and the greatest good for us is what? What's the greatest good that exists in the universe? God. And so to be in right relationship with him means to be blessed by him. He is the greatest good. All good emanates from God. Anything good in your life is from the hand of God and comes because of his blessing. And therefore, to be in right relationship with him is to be in a healthy place, right? In Ezekiel eleven nineteen, it says, I will give them, God's talking about us, I will give my people an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. He's talking about writing his law upon our heart so that we will follow him, right? That we will pursue him. What about the man after God's own heart? David, King David. He said his prayer was, teach me your way, Lord, in the Psalms, that I will remind, that I will rely on your faithfulness. Give me a what? An undivided heart is what David asked for. Our tendency is to divide up our hearts over multiple loves, is it not? Over multiple gods, right? I love my 300 Winchester mag. I love my truck. I love my wife. I love my dog. I love football. We just like put all these things in the same pot as if they're all equal. And God says, those things aren't equal. Your wife has greater prominence above those things than than these other things that you're mentioning, and I have greater prominence than her. You shall have no other gods before me, an undivided heart. God wants the greatest good for us, and the greatest good emanates from him. Therefore, he's a jealous God. He's jealous for us to to be in relationship with him and and for him to do good to us and for us to worship him and be blessed in that way. Ultimately, consider in the positive sense this command is, I shall be your one and only God. I shall be your one and only God. Second one, you shall make for yourself what? You shall not make for yourself what? An idol. Ties in with the first one. Idols are false gods, right? Idols are false gods. God desires that we do not misplace our worship and loyalty, which hurts us and keeps glory that is due him from him. Psalms 106, 19 through 21, at Horeb, they made a calf, right? As soon as Moses got off the mountain, God's people that God had provided the quail for and the manna for, the pillar of fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day to guide them and Moses as a mediator and water from the rock and all the things that he had done for them, crushing the Egyptians and splitting the Red Sea and all those things. While Moses is up on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments, as soon as he comes down, what are his people doing? His high priest, Aaron, his brother, is leading them in the worship of the false calf, right? That's what it's talking about, Psalms 106. 
Verse 19 to 21. They exchanged their glorious God for an image of a bull which simply eats grass. They forgot the God who saved them, who had done great things for them in Egypt, right? Idols. Well, those people are kind of pagans and primitive. We don't do that stuff today. We don't have idols, do we? Do we have idols? Well, maybe they're not metal, or maybe they're not wood, and maybe they're not graven, but I think we have idols. When I hear people talk about Von Miller, they talk about him in an idolatrous way. Man, that guy's the greatest linebacker that's ever lived. Him and Chubb together, they're going to be controlling the edges. And da 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 well, That may be true, but he's just a man. When people talk about LeBron James, they talk about him as if he's God. He's a guy that can play basketball. I'm not diminishing his abilities and talents, but he's just a man. What, what about other idols? I mean, I listen to people talk about Kate Upton and her beauty or Kim Kardashian or, or Bezos and his wealth and Bill Gates or Steve Jobs or all these things. We idolize different people for different things because they're good at those things and we wish we were better at them. Do we have idols in our life? Joy Davidman, C.S. Lewis's wife, says that in today's world, the modern idols are sex, the state, science, and society. Now you think about social media and your experience of that. You think about the news. You think about how you experience your world. Are those not, those four S's, are they not prominent in our world? Do we not put up above so many other things, sex and the state? We want Big Brother to take care of us. Well, around here we're smarter than that, but many people do, right? It's what we punk the Denverites for. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Science, it's got all the answers, right? Technology. These are our modern worship. And you know that there are idols because when we have a problem, we turn to those things before we turn to Jesus, amen? We turn to those things before we turn to Jesus. Before I go see the doctor for an injury, I better be talking to God about it. Because guess who's the healer of the body? The one who made it. It's not that the doctor's not good. She is wonderful or he is wonderful and God's blessed them as a surgeon in their abilities. But as one surgeon told me, Greg, I can do all these things that I want. But if something else, he never said what the something else was, but if something else does not heal the body, it's never gonna be okay. I cannot heal the body. It does it on its own. Well, it doesn't do it on its own. God does it for us, amen? Amen. That's why we pray for people with cancer. That's why we pray for people that are having different issues. Whatever we turn to, to feel satisfied, to feel good from, whatever we turn to in a time of need, those those are our idols. It may be a relationship. It may be a thing. It may be a person. It may be science. It may be different things, but idols are real. And the scripture says, you shall have no other gods and then you shall not make for yourself in the form of anything on heaven or da, 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 no other idols. You shall have no idols. God's serious about this. So I want to give you a grid to think through this. Thomas and Woods in their great book, Gospel of Coach, offer four categories that I've explained to you before about our personal idols. Four categories. Comfort, security, approval, and power and control. You know you have an idol in power if you are longing for influence or recognition or control, if you're longing to have everything go according to the way you want it to go. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound familiar? I like control. Most Americans like to be in control. And you think you don't? Wait till you get in a foreign land. Then you realize how much you love control when you have no control. Right? It's a big idol in our culture, power and control. Comfort, a longing for pleasure and not for pain or suffering. Does that sound like our culture? Is it hedonistic a little bit? Absolutely. Approval, a longing to be accepted or desired. Security, a longing to be safe and to have no problems, all our needs to met. Usually if we boil it down, it's like Calvin stated, the evil in our desire typically is not lie in what we want, but that we want it too much. That we elevate it above the Almighty. 
It's important for us to examine our lives for idols and to root them out because God gives us a healthy boundary that we can have no other idols. Jesus puts it this way as a solution. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things shall be added unto you. Third, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Is this just about his name? No. His name represents him, his personhood, his character, his attributes, who he is. It's not just about using his name in a profane way, it's also about how we live our lives, amen? That if we live our lives saying we're a Christian and then we live as a practical atheist, do we profane the name of the Lord our God? Do we? Yes. If we say we're a follower of Christ but live like an atheist, we profane the name of the Lord our God. If we say God is the answer but live as if everything else is the answer and lead other people to do the same, we profane the name of the Lord our God. Jesus tells us you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God and you will not be held guiltless for doing so. It is very important that we take it seriously that what we say and what we do match and that they bring honor to God's name and his character. As his disciples, we have to live as he lives. We have to live good, wholesome, and winsome lives. Good wholesome, and here's the important one that we sometimes forget, winsome lives. We can't just beat up people that are different than us. We have to love them into the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 10.31 tells us, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Then if we're doing those things in word and deed, then we're using God's name rightly. Fourth, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, right? This boundary keeps in mind in our hearts and our minds our proper place as what? As the creature. As the creature, not the creator. As part of the creation and not the creator. It's interesting that God kind of puts all this back into the creation story, right? Verse 11, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, and then he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, or because of this, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. God roots the Sabbath day in his creation work. If you look at the parallel passage of Deuteronomy 5, he also says on the, that he gave them a Sabbath rest by rescuing them from slavery to the Egyptians. And so the two anchors for the Sabbath day commandment are in creation and in redemption. In both those things, one from Exodus 20 and one from Deuteronomy 5. And so when you put those two things together, is the Sabbath really about a day? Is that what the issue is, a day? No, it's about what's the pattern that God took. Did God need rest on the seventh day? Did God need rest? No, he didn't need rest. He's God. He has no limit to his energy. But God is a model to us chose to rest and to bless as special the seventh day. It's a pattern of creation for us. Later on, Jesus interprets us that, that man was not made for the Sabbath for the day. It's not about the day, but the Sabbath was made for man, right? To help us out. Or else we'd work ourselves in the ground. Some of you guys here, man, you are animals. Some of you are animals. You will work 90 hours a week at a very hard physical job, you're beasts, and you can do it. And guess what? In about 10 years or 20, you won't be able to move your arms above your head. You won't be able to walk. You'll be in a walker. And you don't know it because you're 20-something, and you're an absolute physical stud, okay? So you're going to push yourself too hard. And God says, no, you need to rest. And then what do we do on that day of rest We worship God, right? The early church has always worshiped Jesus on that special day, but it moved it from Saturday to Sunday because Jesus rose from the dead. He rose from the dead on Sunday. And then he appeared to his guys in the upper room on Sunday. And then he reappeared on Sunday. And so they said, that's a special day. That's the day of God. That's the Lord's day. And so that's the special day that we give rest. And so we can debate days. Who cares? The principle is you need to rest and you need to spend your energy on worshiping God and spending time with family. When you leave here, 
I pray that you don't blow your day. Do not go home and work. Go home and spend time with your wife and your husband and your children and your dog. And if you got a cat, I guess you can pet him a little bit too. You know, throw him a little, you know, catnip something. I don't know. I don't know. I don't want those cats. But go fishing. Go playing. Spend time worshiping God and then recreating, recreation, recreating, renewing the human animal that God has made in his image. That's the point of the Sabbath. Now, what about this redemption? God saved the Israelites and gave them a Sabbath rest from the oppression of the Egyptians. And Jesus Christ saved you and I from the oppression of our own sin and has given us a Sabbath rest. If you think that's an improper interpretation, then read Hebrews 4, which that says that Jesus is our ultimate Sabbath rest spiritually. He has done it all. When he went to the cross, when he died on the cross and he bore your sins and mine and the penalty for it, he paid all of it. It's finished. It's done. We bring nothing to the table. It's Jesus plus, well, plus what? Nothing. I'm sorry, you didn't hear it. Jesus plus what? Nothing. That's right. We bring nothing to the table. Jesus has done it all. And he provides us rest in him. That there's now no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. It's rooted in creation. It's rooted in redemption. Job 33, 4, the spirit of the Lord has made me and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Because God is the great life giver, we need to remember him, we need to worship him, and we need to give him a special day because of his provision for our redemption, and we need to love him, okay? Tony Marita puts it this way, the Sabbath is God's gift to us. It benefits us to keep it, and it keeps us in a place where we can anticipate the final rest to come, right? Honor your father and mother. A boundary about teaching us the value of authority. If we cannot honor our parents, how are we going to honor a teacher or a military officer or a police law enforcement person or a politician or whatever else you want to put in there? How are you going to obey a judge in court if you can't obey your parents? Something simple like that. If someone who loves you and cares for you and pumps everything into you, gives you life and sacrifices everything for you, your parents... If you can't be grateful to them and obey them, then how are you going to ever learn how to do it outside the home with somebody important? When you get that ticket for doing 40 and a 20, and you got to appear before the judge, they kind of like it if you say, yes, your honor. Yes, your honor. If you respect the rules of the court, if you kind of listen to their chastisement and you accept your due uh, discipline, that goes well, right? That's a good thing. The police officer that pulls you over, he doesn't want you to give him a hard time. You were doing 40 and a 20. He knows it, you know it, the radar gun knows it. Why are you barking and cussing at him, right? But I see people do that all the time. The officer pulls them over, tells them broke the law, and they're throwing up on this poor guy or gal as if he's the person who did wrong. No. We learn to respect authority by respecting and honoring, obeying our parents, right? And does that end as an adult? Does that end for us as an adult? No. According to 1 Timothy 5.8, we have a responsibility to provide for our aging parents, especially widows or widowers, and to care for them. What I love about this church family, one of the many things is I know personally a number of you are caring for aging parents, and it is difficult at best. It is burdensome in some ways, but you do it because you love them. You do it because you care for them. So, Greg, don't forget me, man, okay, when you make it big. Don't forget me. I'm just saying. Get a little personal plug there. All right, and so what about six? You shall not murder, right? This boundary teaches us to respect that human life is what? Sacred. Human life is sacred. 
God tells us in the, in the Old Testament that life is in the blood. It's also in Hebrews 9.22. And that blood is required to overcome sin. He teaches us that we're made in his image, male and female. And the Psalms teach us that we're fearfully and wonderfully made and that God has ordained all the days of our life. And if we're that special in the highest point of his creation, then for one of us to premeditatively, wantonly kill on purpose another one of us for something that we want is a big deal. It's a grievous sin. And Jesus interprets this a little bit differently. He says it's not just if you kill it. You've heard it's an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, right? But I'm telling you, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, that if you have anger towards your brother, if you say to him, Raka, you fool, yet you're in danger of hellfire. Because murder begins often with the anger and the resentment and the bitterness towards another person. If you don't believe that's true, you don't understand Cain and Abel, right? We were reading this this morning. I was reading this and talking about this in my Sunday school class. And, and Cain and Abel bring their, their offerings before the Lord in Genesis 4. And Abel's offering was more acceptable than, than Cain's. And Cain, it says, he becomes angry in his heart towards his brother. God intervenes and tries to help him. He says, look, if you offer up an appropriate sacrifice, will you not be righteous before me? In other words, come on, let's do it. I'll help you out. Cain, does he go and offer the appropriate sacrifice? No. That anger in his heart turns into premeditation to kill his brother. And he says to his brother, let's go out in the field. And it says while they're out in the field, he strikes his brother down and he kills him in cold blood. What's God's response to him? Your brother Abel's blood cries out against you from the ground. Do you think God misses such things? He does not. He does not. The law may miss it, but God doesn't. We're accountable for such things. It matters that we have a sanctity of human life. That applies to abortion. That applies to euthanasia. That applies to a variety of different things, bioethics. It applies that human beings are sacred and above animal kingdom and above the plant kingdom. We are not equal to them. Amen? We are not equal to plants and animals. That is a lie straight from the pit of hell. We are the most sacred of God's creation according to his own word. And so we are valuable. We cannot murder and kill each other. Seven, do not commit adultery. Is this about keeping marriages good? Is that what this is really about? Not entirely. It's about faithfulness and purity, right? It's good for our marriages, but it's also good for our relationship with God. It's also good for our relationship with God. What I find interesting about this, this commandment is this. The scripture says in multiple places in the Old Testament, God accuses his people who are walking away from him as being an adulterous people and generation. Isn't that interesting that he uses those terms? That in the New Testament, God talks about Jesus dying for his bride, the what? The church, his people. Whether the Old Testament or New Testament, it's about relationship. And that's what adultery is about. When you stand up and you give a vow, one man, one woman, for life, till death do you part. In a vow before friends and family, and then you also file the appropriate paperwork with the government. When you do that, then you are married and you stay faithful to one another and you stay pure in the most powerful of relationships, the sexual relationship. But it's only a symbol of the whole relationship. Any counselor can tell you that. And it's important that we are faithful to our spouses like we are faithful to our God, that we are pure with our spouses like we are pure with our God. That excludes any form of extramarital sex, affairs, other people. It excludes premarital sex before you're married. You should stay pure until you're married. It excludes cohabitation living together, which is a sin before God. That doesn't mean that we can't fix these sins or get redemption from these sins or God's grace cover these sins. It does. There's no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus. But if we continually perpetuate in our sin, do you think God's just going to overlook that and you're all good? No. We have to remain pure and faithful in marriage to our spouses. 
What's the next one say? It says, you shall not steal. Why is stealing a big deal? This boundary is about honoring hard work and being content with what God blesses you. It's about a God that is good to us and us trusting in that God and that attribute of his goodness and beneficence to us, right? Paul tells us, he knows what it's like to have a lot and what it's like to be poor. How, can any of you relate to Paul? You know what it's like to have a lot and what it's like to be poor? Can anybody relate here? You've experienced both ends of the swing. And Paul says, look, if I got food, if I got a little clothing on my back and I got God, godliness with contentment is great gain. Stealing is a horrible sin because it tells somebody else, I dishonor you for the hard work that you have put in and for how God's blessed you. And you have something that I want, therefore I'm going to take it without working for it. There's a great scene in a movie with Russell Crowe. Great scene where he's a boxer back in the 30s, a true story with his son. And in that movie, his son, they're in the 30s and everybody's starving and they're living in this, this squalor and this one, this one light bulb that can't pay for that and he's working the docks with a broken hand and he's fighting these pro fights and he's making money and he's just trying to get his, his family through. And he even goes to the point that he goes to the rich man and he holds out a, a hat and he begs don't give money for me, give it for my family so that they may eat, that my children may not starve. He's a humble man. But in this scene, that's a great scene out of Hollywood. Those are rare. But his son goes into a bread store and comes running out with this piece of bread. And his dad catches him and grabs him and scoops him around to the bread store. He doesn't beat him up. He doesn't kill him. He doesn't punish him. He says, look, we don't steal. Because to steal from that shop owner is to steal from his table and the food off of somebody else's table. Though we may be without, we do not steal from another. What a great ethos, right, that we need to have. What a great, great ethos. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony, right? It's helpful in our boundary of our relationships to tell the truth because at the basis of all relationships is trust, and trust is built upon honesty. If you lie to me and I lie to you, trust is lost. How hard is it to gain trust? How hard is it to gain trust? It's very hard. It's very hard to gain trust. It's very hard to gain trust. How easy is it to lose trust? In a blink of an eye, right? Can you think of a relationship that was going great with somebody that you loved or cared about that was somebody close and everything was going great and then something happened, there was a misunderstanding and you were accused and then that trust was lost and that relationship was lost and you grieved over it. I've had a number of those over the years. You just grieve over those. And I, and I have to give those to Jesus and say, I don't understand how this misunderstanding happened, and they don't want to believe me, so God, I have to put it in your court that you're going to make it right on the other side in heaven because I can't make it right here. And i got to give it to Jesus. But you shall not bear false witness. You shall not lie. You need to be honest in your dealings with other people. You need to do what you say you're going to do. Jesus himself in John 1 is described as being filled with grace and what? Truth. Our God is a truthful God. And so we as people need to be a truthful people. That doesn't mean that we don't make mistakes. We all make mistakes and lie. We all shade the truth and we all come up short. But we need to strive for those things. And finally, you shall not covet. Contentment reflects the heart. It is a mirror to our souls. Desiring what another has is covetousness. Not being content with what God's given you is covetousness. I know that's an old word, but the idea is that you want what God has not given you. You desire what God has decided not to bless you with yet, or maybe never. And it says, do not covet your neighbor's what? His wife. Yeah, that's a bad thing. That's not going to go well. You get on my wife, we're going to be on a short end of stuff, right? That's not going to go well for you. Don't covet his servants. Don't covet his animals. Don't covet his land. Don't, don't want what he has. Be content. Godliness with contentment is great game. Back to 1 Timothy, right? God wants us to be happy with his provision and to trust him with what he has seen fit to give us. That doesn't mean we don't work hard to get better but it means that we're thankful and content with what he blesses us with because we believe he cares for and provides and protects us. These are the Ten Commandments, and Jesus upholds them 
and summarates them down to two in the New Testament. Matthew, in the book of Matthew, he says, look, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. To love the Lord your God with what? All your heart, soul, strength, and might. And to love your neighbor as what? Yourself. All the law and the prophets are summarized in these. Hinge on this. If we can learn to do those two things, we have down the Ten Commandments. God tells us that, that this is the whole thing, the whole enchilada, so to speak. If we can learn that love is the overarching thing that covers over a multitude of sins, the way the New Testament says it, that that is the big piece. Love for God with our whole heart that's not divided. The first four commandments. Loving our neighbors as much as we love ourselves, the last six, the horizontal ones, then we are going to have this code down. And our lives are going to be a blessing. Our lives are going to be a blessing to other people, and they are going to be a blessing to us, and we're going to be in right relationship with God who will bless us, right? That's the big picture of this. But there's a problem. And the problem is this that you and I can't fulfill those things. We can't do all 10 of those things, not even when we boil them down into two. Jesus knew this. God knew this. I mean, as soon as Moses, the mediator, comes down the mountain, his people, God's people, are already breaking the first three commandments. Already. First three. With a golden calf. He's not even off the mountain and they're breaking it, right? Are you and I any different than those Israelites? Can we uphold all those? Jesus tells us what the standard is in Matthew 5, 48. Be perfect as the heavenly father is perfect. Are you perfect? Am I perfect? Because I'm certainly not. If you're close to me, you know that's not true. I'm a messed up man. I need Jesus bad. Do you remember the story of the rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and he says, Lord, what do I need to do for eternal life? And Jesus says, he quotes what? Parts of the Ten Commandments, do not kill, do not commit adultery, do not do this, all the stuff. And what's the rich young ruler say? He says, all these things I've done since birth. But then he fails the very first commandment in the next sentence. Jesus says, go and sell everything that you have. Give it to the poor and come and follow me. He's testing his heart to see who is God, him or his bank account. And what does the biblical text tell us about the rich young ruler? His face drops, and he goes away exceedingly sad because of what? He had great wealth. He failed the very first commandment before the sentence was over. And you and I fail them all the time. That's why the last thing is about the Ten Commandments, that we need one who fulfills that standard. Be perfect as their heavenly father is imperfect. And that person is in the complete person and work of Jesus Christ, in him alone. You and I are not sinless. Forgive me for saying that. But you're sinful people. And your pastor is the worst of all. Okay? We need Jesus bad. And the reason we need Jesus bad is because the New Testament tells us that he never sinned with his mouth and he was sinless in his behavior and everything that he did was perfect. That he was perfectly obedient to the Father's will. Jesus said in John 4, my, my food, my substance is to do the will of the Father. And he did it all the time. So we need someone in our place. We can't fulfill the Ten Commandments. We can't fulfill the two great commandments. We fail and we come up short. And in that sin, we do not glorify God and thus fulfill our design and purpose. So we need somebody else in our place. That's where Jesus steps in. Isn't that a wonderful truth, the gospel? That Jesus Christ takes your place and mine. That he lives the perfect life that we cannot that he models the perfect life that we cannot do, and that he goes to the cross and he bears the shame and the guilt and the full penalty of God's wrath against your sin and mine, his judgment upon our evil. God takes it all in the form of Jesus Christ, and he gives us, according to 2 Corinthians 5, 21, in the great exchange, he gives us his perfection and righteousness. 
Galatians teaches us this, that Jesus bore the curse of the law. One born under the law of a woman, he bore the curse of the law upon the tree, the cross. He did what you and I cannot do. And so the fulfillment of understanding the words from God that are arranged in a specific way to teach us something, the commands of God that is this ethical code that we're to follow that are summarized in two by Jesus Christ, the end game of all that is that you and I fail. And dare I say it, forgive me, but I think we fail daily at the Ten Commandments or the Two Commandments. But Jesus fills the gap. He does what you and I cannot do. And when we live in a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ, we repent or turn away from our sin and we turn towards and trust Christ and we're in right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 1 says, there's now no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 5, 1 says, we now have peace with God through Christ Jesus. And Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, empowers you and I to do the very things that we cannot do on our own. And so we have day-to-day, real-time, live success in obeying the Ten Commandments and living right with God and with each other because of the Spirit of God that has given us a new heart, one of life and not death, one of eternal life. I don't know where you're at today. I don't know what you're into. I don't know what God's talking to you about. I know that God takes the initiative like he did on the mountain, the Smoky Mountain, and he moves into our sphere all the time, and he moves into our lives, and he seeks to connect to us and to love us and to draw us into a relationship with his son, Jesus Christ. And maybe you're here today, and you've heard that, and you know that, or you've never heard that before, but you're experiencing that now, and God's calling you to give your life to Christ. My encouragement for you today is to say yes. In a moment, we're going to have an altar call. You have an opportunity to come forward. I'd be happy to pray with you and help lead you into a right relationship with Christ through prayer. Maybe you want to do it right in the privacy of your seat, but you better take it seriously because God takes it seriously. Maybe you're here this morning And you have a relationship with Christ, but it's been on the rocks a little bit. It hasn't been what it's supposed to be. You've kind of wandered off from him, and you're kind of doing your own thing, and you're breaking the first commandment right off. You have other idols and gods before Christ, and and you need to return to the lover of your souls, Jesus. That's what this altar is for, a place for you to come and say, God, somewhere along the line, I got off. I got off on a misstep, and I ended up in the jungle. Lord, bring me back around. That's what this altar's for. Maybe you need to come and pray for someone else. Whatever God's asking you to do, the only answer for